Today you've been invited to hear the voices of parents and students on a critical issue that we're looking at in our community right now, uh, mayoral control of schools. And these voices that you see on the stage are representative of those groups that are most impacted and will be most impacted by such a legislation if it happens in our community. So it becomes really important that we create a forum to hear those voices and to hear the voices of parents and students and have them weigh in on what they think about uh, mayoral control of schools. So the way we'll spend our time today is they will, uh, I will invite them to do some introductions and they will tell you who they are um, and their position uh, and ex ex some comments about mayoral control that they'd like to share with us. And then we will, um, after they've done their introductions and their opening statements, we will do a, a, um, an exercise called the fishbowl. How many of you have, have ever been part of the fishbowl? Okay, good. Here you do. Um, don't have to be a fish to be part of a fishbowl. Um, but the fishbowl is that I'm going to ask this panel a series of questions, and they're going to answer them in dialogue amongst each other in front of you. Um, so you will kind of be on the outside, sort of peering in to their perspectives, and they will give the height, the breadth, and the depth of their perspectives around this issue. Um, and so they will do that for about 15 to 20 minutes, and what we'll ask you to do is to listen and to take it in. After that, uh, for about an hour and 30 minutes, you will get a chance then to engage this panel of experts, and you'll be able to ask them questions about what you heard or make comments. My name is Mary Yokoi. I, I go to school in Jackson, Virginia right now. Um, and my position on mayoral control is, is I, I oppose it. Um, and probably the, my primary reason is it's the elimination of participatory democracy. Um, it takes away the school board. And um, I first became active um, in the in the budget cuts that happened last year. And that was my first experience with having a say in what was going on. And, um, watching the wonderful students that Sony organized. Um, and so I went to a lot of school board meetings and I spoke a lot and heard lots of people speak, lots of parents, and um, the fact that that's being eliminated is the first sign that this shouldn't be in place. It's elimination of participatory democracy. Um, and we're, we're having this panel right now because we feel that um, we haven't seen the dialogue between Duffy and the parents and the students. Um, so if, he, if he's not engaging in that public forum now, um, what can we expect if Maryland goes is put in place? Um, we're having we're having this. Um, I and, and I think I think the other members agree. We feel strongly that we haven't gotten our voice out. <coughs> and if, if that's the scenario now, then it will happen. Um, so I'm, I'm not for that. Thanks, Megan. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Howard Eagle, and uh, I'm a parent in the Rochester City School District. I have uh, we have two children, uh, one at Wilson Commencement down the street, uh, a ninth grader, Mia, and uh, our son Howard is at school number 42. Uh, some of what I, I'm going to say will be repetitive in terms of what you just heard, but I think it's worth repeating uh, some of what you. 
you just heard. Uh, we oppose, we are opposed to uh, the idea of narrow control for five fundamental reasons. And when I say we, I'm speaking of my wife and I uh, as parents who should be here, I hope it's on the way. I'm speaking of our organization ARM, I'm speaking of our broader coalition, the Community Education Task Force. The first reason is that, as students have said, it would diminish, uh, that is reduce, citizens' hard-won, blood-stained constitutional right to vote for local representatives. Uh, I believe, and I know others of us believe, that uh, Martin Luther King and Megan Evers and Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, Stokely Carmichael, and many others uh, who spent uh, a great deal of their lives fighting for voting rights, bones would rattle in their graves at the thought of a discussion about diminishing our voting rights in 2010. Uh, we believe that it, uh, secondly, places too much power in the hands of one individual, in this case, that would be Mayor Robert Duffy. Thirdly, we believe that there's a possibility that future mayors may not be interested in or capable of managing the Rochester City School District. So that's a real danger. Uh, fourth, uh, we do not believe that the mayor has a realistic plan in terms of improving uh, 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 academics or physical management. Uh, and if he does, he certainly has not, has not shared it with this uh, community. Um, fifth, there is no, and this is very important, there is no credible evidence that mayoral control results in academic achievement and improvement in academic achievement. In fact, what the research shows is that in some places where mayoral control has been implemented, the gap, the achievement gap between white students and children of color has grown, has grown larger. Now we can't say for certain that it's because mayoral control was implemented, but it hasn't helped. That's for certain. Um, and I'll add to that list of five things that, uh, in my view, it is a racist concept in the sense that the majority of the electorate in Rochester are people of color, and if this legislation becomes law, what that would mean is that the people of Rochester would be the only school district in Monroe County in which people would lose their right to vote for local representatives on, the, on, on their board of education. Meanwhile, in all of the surrounding towns and villages that are overwhelmingly white, people would have that right, would retain that right, and that is a throwback, in my mind, to Jim Crowism. Uh, and I'll also add, and this is very important, that those who will make this decision ultimately will be the New York State Legislature. And that is a body that has been called by the New York Times, by the Democratic Chronicle, and other um, sources, including you, Dr. Keller, uh, are one of the most dysfunctional governing bodies uh, in the nation if not the most dysfunctional state legislature in the nation. And Dr. Keller makes uh, the point in this article, and if you haven't seen this article, if you're not familiar with it, I would urge everyone to read it. Uh, it was a commentary in the uh, city newspaper back in January, January 14th. Mayoral control doesn't work and is wrong. Dr. Keller makes the argument in this article that if mayoral control makes sense, then since we have one of the most dysfunctional state legislatures in the nation, then it would make sense for the governor to attempt to take control of the legislature and disband the legislature, which would mean then that we would lose our rights as local citizens to vote for our state representatives. And so in the end, he says, I don't support it for that reason because it's still diminishing democracy. But the point is, it's a logical argument. Thank you. Our children are being sold out. 
uh, really, really being, you know, criminally harmed by what should be a social good. Public education is something that in our past, in the history books, they tell us that there's such a thing as the American dream, where public education is sort of the key to that dream. And, you know, through college and through being involved in various uh, um, struggles, you know, to, to change things and make things better, I think a lot of us have learned that the American dream really isn't there for an awful lot of people. And public education could be something that could get us closer to, to actually being able to realize that dream. So public education is something worth defending. Um, my problem is that the move to mayoral control is actually, I view it as, as a lubricant, as grease, to actually accelerate the selling out of our kids. And it will actually make these trends that are harming our opportunities for education even worse at a much faster rate there, and with much less out. public access to the processes where we could resist those changes and actually move forward to shape authentic educational reforms. Um, people talk about privatization and, you know, in our, in our task force meetings, sometimes people have questioned that term, so, you know, that's kind of complex and abstract. We need to, to stick to, to really simple things. But actually, privatization is not a complicated concept at all. What it talks, what it means is taking public money for public education and channeling it into private businesses so that they can manage our schools and suck off a whole lot of money in a very cloudy way. That's what privatization means. Now, we can talk about charter schools. Um, charter schools are not inherently bad. There are some excellent charter schools. There are some terrible charter schools. There are some very, very fraudulent charter schools. And I suggest people read today's New York Times for some analyses of what's going on in Niagara Falls and Buffalo in terms of millions of dollars of public money being wasted and actually going into the coffers of real estate developers and other you know, bankers and private interests. So it's not conspiracy theory when we talk about uh, you know, these changes being uh, a way of the rich siphoning off of our resources that are meant for our students. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that, but I think you know, we need to definitely continue to work together whether mayoral control comes to be or not, and there's a good chance that it will not. You know, there's no Senate sponsor. Um, this may not come to be, but we definitely need to continue to work together to make reforms and to resist, especially resist this privatization and the process of our hard-earned dollars going for rich people to get richer while our public school system is staffed. Thanks, Mary. Mona? Good. good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mona Prade. I'm a parent of currently one student that's at number 43 school, as well as two other students that have recently graduated. One graduated last year from Sherlock High School, and another about five years ago from Marshall High School. So I've been a parent in the district for a very long time, needless to say. Um, from my experiences, from noticing from both sides, from the side of the parent and from working in the district myself at various times throughout my children's um, educational careers, you can say. Um, I've noticed that, yes, Rochester City School District has its share of problems and issues and a lot of concerns as a parent, as somebody um, that's a part of this community. Uh, we see the results of those issues and those problems. The only thing is, my, I, I'm opposed to the mayor taking control of the district in order to solve some of these problems. What I don't believe is that mayor, the mayor, taking control of the Rochester City School District is the solution to these problems. And I have yet to see or hear from the mayor on what it is that he proposes that will be the solution. So that's my statement. Thank you, Thank you. There are some say I don't need a mic, but I guess I'll take one anyway. I would definitely like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to definitely thank our members of City Council who decided to join us tonight. We thank you for coming. You know, even though we really appreciate a lot of you, your views might be different, but you're still here. We really appreciate that. The large majority of you guys have decided to come. Thank you for that. Also, our members of the school board, so I'd like to thank you guys for being here too. I know you guys have a meeting tonight. You can't stay the whole time. And I also would be this not to thank how this came together here, how the hard work members of our committee, committee task force did to make this happen. I'd like to thank Diane and her husband for making things happen that happened with them tonight. The work Pat did. I'd just like to thank everybody 
in general for making this happen. And as I said, my name is Michael Mason. I'm a member of the Community Education Task Force. I have a son that goes to the school. He's in the back, back there. Very proud of him here today. And one thing I would like to say why I'm so part of against this is that, as we, we all said, it takes away our voting rights. Because one thing that has happened over the years, at least no matter what the school board did, we might not have agreed with everything, but at least we were able to come talk to them. If there were problems, we could come talk to them. We might not agree what they had to say, but at least that seven member body was there. And to me, that's, that's something that's so important that now that wants to be taken away. And, and, and to me, Boston, New York City, Chicago, it's shown there that it's not working. Data has shown graduation rates are going down. Graduation rates are coming up a couple percentage points. So to me, we have cities that don't have mural control, but these cities are doing a great job. So there's no data that's been shown to me by Mayor Duffy, anybody else that this could work. You know, I saw the plans. You know, I see the superintendent going from answering to seven people to I think 40 people. So what is, what is that gonna help? How is that gonna help us prove our graduation rate? How is that gonna improve one thing, rank 11 as far as poverty in Rochester? One thing about it, what's happening now, I graduate, it's a lot to do with poverty. I mean, if a, if a child's going to school, he's not eating, he's not reading, he's not sleeping, domestic violence issues in his house, of course he's not gonna do well in school. So one thing that we need to do as a public in general, as a school board, as a city council, we need to work together and see how we can make these things change. Because when it's all said and done, I'm claiming this right now, that mural control would not come in existence. But we have to work from there. City council has to work from there. But therefore, city council and the board have to work from there. And we all have to do this as a community. One person cannot do this. One mayor cannot do this. But everybody has to come to the table, and we have to do this together. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So now I have a series of questions that I'm going to ask you as the panel. Um, and I'm going to ask you to, to jump in and answer these questions. Don't feel that each person has to answer them, because we be here all night. But I think these are important questions to engage. So my first question is, how do you respond to the charge that our schools are failing so badly that we should be willing to give narrow control a try, which includes giving up your voting rights in the interest of our children's future? <coughs> Who'd like to respond to it? First, we do acknowledge that our schools are failing that we have a, a serious uh, academic crisis, and it's not new, it's an old crisis. Uh, however, in terms of uh, the question of people having to give up their voting rights in order to produce change, that's a false dichotomy. There's no, I've, I've said, I said earlier, there's no evidence that, that uh, implementation of mural control uh, will produce success, and certainly uh, whether or not success occurs does not hinge on whether or not people have a right to elect their local representatives. There's no relationship. I just want to say that the, the right to vote is being used by some, some people some politicians, they're, they're being dismissive of the right to vote as if it's an abstract symbol that we've actually been accused of being you know, selfish adults or trying to cling to this symbol that really is kind of empty and meaningless when you're looking at the, the issue of our kids um, being sold out every day in, in the schools. Um, so my response is, first of all, the right to vote is not an abstraction. We need to look at it not only in terms of the sacrifices that have been made in terms of lives lost, in terms of people losing businesses, lives uprooted. But these are concrete things. These are not abstractions to the people who are still living today who made those sacrifices. But even in the current circumstances, if we're not looking at the sacrifices that were made for the voting rights legislation, if we're looking at today's reality, 
the right to be involved in the democratic process involving our children in our schools is not there's, there's not a lack of connection. There's a direct connection between who makes decisions and what the outcomes of those decisions are. Anytime we're looking at making progressive change, whether it's in education or any other context, it's critical that the people most directly affected are the ones who lead that movement to make those changes. And if you look in history, no matter what kind of progressive history you're looking at, the leadership has to come from the people most directly involved. People in the suburbs would never dream of giving up their right to control their schools. The cities should not dream of giving up our right to struggle for progressive change. Now, yes, there has been problems for decades, but that doesn't mean that the answer is to give up our involvement in the process. The answer is more democracy, not less democracy. The answer is more direct involvement, not less direct involvement. And that is hard. And another thing that I really have problems with um, are some of the people who control the, you know, the media spin on, on parents in this district and students in this district are so negative and so inaccurate. Parents are involved. People are struggling to make sure that their kids get educated. The vast majority of parents are very committed. And it's a very ugly lie, the picture that's made of families in this community. Um, one of the things that our task force has done is we've gone out and we've talked to people door to door. We've seen the kids around the dining tables doing their work. We've heard the stories of engagement and problems engaging that parents have had with teachers and administrators. Those are the solutions we need to work on. Is, um, you know, some of us have a lot of experience being involved with our students. Maybe we need to get into some peer relationships where we go in with people who are encountering obstacles with their schools. My husband, for example, went in with his niece when um, his, his great niece, who was uh, being harshly disciplined, inappropriately disciplined, or a small misjudgment, being, you know, talking about bringing the police in and everything. She went in with her, with, with the niece, the mother of the child. That's the kind of thing, you know, and it was easily resolved. When they see solidarity among family members or solidarity among neighbors, that's a way of making positive change. Um, Thank you. So, okay. <laughs> So I wonder if I could ask one of the young people to weigh in on that question. What do you think about this whole thing about voting rights and narrow control? How do you respond to that charge that the schools are failing so badly that we should be willing to give up our voting rights in the interest of our children's future? Speaking as a uh, social studies teacher, former social studies teacher, I'm retired as of January, but I'll always be a social studies teacher. We we teach our young people that in social studies, in history, that there's nothing more sacred than uh, participating as citizens in the democratic process. And so this is hypocritical uh, in that sense. And let me mention something that I saw. In fact, again, Dr. Kelly, this was a response to your article that I mentioned earlier. This was a blogger writing in the city newspaper. He, the, I don't know, he or she goes by the uh, name of Rehab on, on the blogger site. Rehab said well, that in Medina, of all places, and I don't know if he knows what he's talking about, I'm going to go look it up. He said that 90% of the young people in the Medina school system are on free or reduced lunch, and their graduation rate is 50%. And he says, we don't see that in the news. And certainly no one in Medina is talking about mayoral control. So he asked the question, what's the difference? There's an answer to that question. Thank you, Mr. Eagle. So my second question for the panel is, from your point of view, what do you see as the biggest problems with the way schools are run now? And what and would changing to mayoral control actually help? Or would it hurt? I think that the problem of 
poverty and not having a home to support you is a, a much bigger issue than what administrative process we're using. And I think implementing the, the mayoral control process doesn't address the real problem. I agree, I strongly agree. As I said before, poverty is something that, that's so strong in our community that our children are dealing with in their lives right now. I think things can be done better as far as running the schools, but what we have to do more as, a, as parents, we have to get more involved in that. Coming to the school board meetings and doing more to give our input more. We can say that this is not being done, but at a school board meeting, we just can't have three people there and more tend to come out just for a budget. And as I looked at something, I was looking at some data. In New York City, one of the schools that Mayor Duffy has talked about who's had more control, I think, now for seven years, and it stated the high school graduation rate for the city students rose to 59% in 2009, up from 56.4 in 2008. So, um, that's what was announced, but they've had mayoral control for seven years now. And what, what point is that they reach and get this? And at the celebration, though, some education experts and officials noted that only 44.6% of the students earned the more rigorous regents diplomas, which would be required of all students in 2012. And as I stated again, this is a, a district that has mayoral control. And as I stated, they're not even at 60% yet. So definitely more needs to be done. And as I stated, we have to do more as far as a body, as a board, as a superintendent, and as a staff. Well, yeah, I guess I'd be the person on the panel that would say, I honestly believe it is a system. It, it is the way that the schools are ran. Not only at the school level, not only at that level, the classroom level, um, the school level, the board level, all the way up to whatever level we want to go up to. It is a system. It really is a system that is not working. And time and time again, we see the system not working. So it's not that the kids are failing. We really are failing the kids. We really are. And um, it is systematic. It's the way things are governed. It's the way things are put in place. It's the way that when we talked about our voting rights, giving up those rights, well, basically, that's an illusion. For those of you who have children in this system, like myself, and have experienced this system, you will see that that voting right or the rights that we supposedly have as consumers, as the parent, as the student, it is really not there. It looks like it's there, but it's not. Okay? And honestly speaking, we're going to tell the truth here. The truth is this. We do not have to give up our rights because, first of all, they have been taken from us. They have been diminished on every level from the classroom on up, okay? And basically, it has started like there from a long time ago. We are not there at the table when they make these policies regarding our children. We are not there when they enforce them, implement them. We are only called when they need us to come and pick up our children from getting on their nerves, okay? That's where we participate. That's where our rights are, to come into that school when we are removing our children from the school, okay? My problem is, it's the way it's designed. I'm looking at a system, a curriculum, a staff that is not prepared to deal with the things that these kids deal with every single day. Poverty may be an issue, but it does not have to be the deciding factor. It does not. There's lots of children that come out of horrible situations, but they have resiliency, and they have people that support them, believe in them, are from their culture and understand them, and is able to evidently reach them. And we don't have a lot of that. We don't have a mindset that's encouraging. We don't have an attitude that's supportive of the staff that is there. And quite honestly speaking, I don't know how you change that attitude because that's what it is. And there's no accountability. So if you choose not to educate a kid today, that is your option. And you know what? People in those buildings, it should not be an option. Whether you educate my child today should not be an option. But yet it is. And that's a system. That's a design. That I see that's a problem. And yes, the kids come with some issues. Yeah. But you know what? We need to take some of these dollars, and yes, the district gets a lot. Take some of these dollars and design these classes that's going to be conducive to learning, to helping these children meet the needs. And what I mean by conducive, I mean we have a district that is not student-centered, parent-centered, 
consumer center. That's by design, that it meets the needs of the staff and the staff only. And that's curriculum on out. Thanks, Mona. Well, um, I personally think that it's the school's fault and also the students because some students want to be lazy and not try to do anything to help us out. Right. And how they know that the school rate are dropping for graduation and stuff, but they don't want to do the city law. And um, I personally, I used to be kind of the one that didn't really care about my education. But I woke up and realized that getting an education is something that really is important. So we should do our best to um, really get our education and work hard just to grow people up. This, I saw some people sort of blink and maybe uh, Maybe people are not clear, but I, 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 I agree with Mona in terms of the illusion. I think we talked a little bit about this when we met. Um, in terms of elections, the people we vote for are not chosen by us as part of it because of the system. So that they are chosen by the political party bosses. We're not actually choosing the vote we vote for. And um, um, we. I don't want to pick on you, Dr. Keller, but you've written about this. You're not the only one who's written about it. That we, there are some answers, we believe, to that. In the illusion, eliminating the illusion. We can have nonpartisan elections. Uh -huh. We can eliminate the salary for board members. And we can have term limits. That would help with the illusion that, 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 um, that Mona mentioned. But, but it is indeed systemic. Now I speak again as a teacher, one who has watched. Because to bring us back to the question, the question is, What's, what's wrong with the way uh, schools are functioning? And there are some things that are wrong. As one who has watched uh, how buildings run for 23 years, first of all, we're working, in terms of systemically, we're working with a model, and I know this speaks to you, Wallace, because Wallace talks about the deficit model all the time, that is roughly 150 years old. It's a one-size-fits-all model. Basically, that's one thing that's wrong. That's right. Much of the instruction, much of what happens in classrooms is being driven by standardized testing. That's, right. that's another thing that's wrong. Um, now, uh, as it relates to um, uh, leadership, running schools, I mean running schools, like any other institution, a critical element is leadership. And I'm telling you, based on my observations, I'm not convinced that we always have the best available leadership running buildings. In fact, I'm convinced that we don't. I'm convinced that we, that we do not. Now, the second part of the question then becomes, well, one more thing. Often environments are not inviting in terms of the way schools are, are run. We, the school district touts this belief in collaboration, cooperation. We want parent involvement. We want community involvement. But when you come into the schools and see how they actually function, and how people act, it becomes clear that it's the last thing that some people want. So we do have a problem, environmental problems in the school in terms of how, how it functions. The second part of the question then becomes, will mere oral, was, will mere oral control help? Obviously not, since we see that in school districts that have mere oral control, they have the same issues that we're discussing, the same problems, and they haven't been able to address them successfully. There's, again, I can't say this enough, there's no evidence, none, no credible research, no evidence that mural control would make a difference in terms of how schools are run. Thank you, Mr. So my next question for you is, um, you've heard that the mayor talks about mural control leading to definite improvements in graduation rates and achievement. Um, if he's given a, a chance to experiment with this, this model. How do you respond to that? Um, I highly oppose that. I don't think the mayor actually knew what he was talking about because in New York City, they scores only went up, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 17% in graduation rate, and as well as Chicago. Also, 
in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in Austin, Texas, they are on the top of the list as the NEAP, as Chicago and New York City is at the bottom of the list. Okay. Very good. Very good.
And so that's another part of the inflation. Systematic grade inflation. I brought an example. This is a chart from the New York State Education Department, the Regents Examination in Global History and Geography in June 2008. This is an example of systematic grade inflation. What it says at the top of the chart to us teachers is, to determine the student's final score, locate the student's total essay score across the top of the chart and the total of part one and part three A, which is multiple choice and constructed response and DBQ, uh, and then score down the side of the chart. The point where the two scores intersect is the student's final examination score. For example, a student receiving a total essay score of six and a total part one and part three A score of 50 would receive a final examination score of 81. You understand? 50 and 6 equal 81. <laughs> this is the State Education Department's chart. Um, also, social promotion is, is another um, consideration that many of our young people have been moved along before they um, acquired the knowledge and the skills that they need to be in order to be successful at the next level. And then when they get in high school, is when this really shows up when social promotion stops. And in terms of what uh, Mona was raising about young people leaving school with diplomas that they can barely read, you don't have to take her word or my word, just go talk to the professors out at MCC. That's where many, many of our students go. And ask how many of them have to go through developmental studies courses before they even take one credit bearing course. So everybody who graduates is definitely not fair. Thank you, Mr. So I have one final question for, for the panel, and then we're going to open it up to questions and answers from our audience. And that question is, let's assume that mayoral control is defeated. Um, there are voices that say and I, that we cannot keep the status quo. So if we're not going to keep the status quo, what, in your view, in your opinion, should be different? And I would if you can answer this question as we go down the panel. This is our final question. What do you think should be different? I think um, one of the things that was, was mentioned before was um, the amount of illusions that are in the system. Uh, there are legal illusions, um, uh, s system illusions. There are also um, in the schools, you know, the, the parent-teacher association, that's an illusion. Um, student government is an illusion. Um, and if we if we actually listened to to those to those things that we have set up, I think that we could make some change, but it's it's too frustrating to even go off and you don't get through. I would say that I could talk about this one for a few hours. I know I don't have it this time. Let me mention a couple things. I'll say this. I, I give uh, uh, the mayor uh, credit for having raised this issue. I think he raised it in the wrong way. But hopefully we can never go back to the status quo after this. So we need to uh, develop a very large table where everyone who has some uh, meaningful input, something to add, can gather around the table and develop a comprehensive plan for educational reform. Now, I didn't come to politics, but I'm going to mention this. I ran for school board in 2003, 2007, and 2009. 
And each time I ran on the same platform because I believed in what I was running on. I, I ran on, I'm on a four point platform. What I said is there are four things that if we do those four things, I believe that it will go uh, far in terms of producing the kind of fundamental uh, sustainable change that we need. One is we have to focus with laser-like precision on basic skills development, reading, writing, and math skills, which represents the foundation of all knowledge, the building block. And we have to be careful with this one because Diane Ravitch talks about in her book that we need to go beyond basic skills, and of course we do, to get to higher order thinking, critical thinking, analysis, and so forth. But if you don't even have the building blocks, you can't go beyond. So I think that's critical. Secondly, we need to end all forms of social promotion, moving young people from one grade level to the next before they require the adequate knowledge and skills to be successful. And we have to be careful with this one because people will, will tell you uh, very quickly, oh, but the research says retention is bad. Actually, the research does not say that. What the research says is if you retain young people and do the same thing over again, then that's crazy, really. Um, Parent and community involvement, we have to become very serious about it at every level in terms of parents and community having real input into the decision making process. And again, the district, the school district touts the importance of this, but if you know how things work, then you know that the importance is not really placed on that. Uh, and the fourth uh, point is uh, development of authentic, authentic alternative education models, especially for our young people who are the most challenging, those who've been shuffled through the system and are now sitting in high school reading at a third and fourth grade level and people are playing games with them talking about they're going to get a Regents diploma. So we need alter authentic alternative education programs and I'll add this to the list, even though this wasn't part of the platform. We need an investigation and then a revamping of special education services, the way that they are delivered. And let me share this with you. This is very, very important. I, had, I listened to this um, uh, um, speaker uh, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Desiree Holmes, who's a, an African-American woman and also a clinical psychologist at the University of uh, Rochester, University of Rochester Medical Center. And if I could just read just a little bit of what she said, as I sat here listening to her, it was, she said that children are being diagnosed with bipolar disorder at alarming rates. It has become the number one diagnosis now for African American boys in particular at, a very, at very young ages. And prior to 10 years ago, young people under the ages of 18 were rarely diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And the point is that mental health is a major barrier that impedes education. If children are not uh, developed mentally, they're not able to transition to higher order skills, which of course is a problem for teachers, and for educators. We also have to target, get a handle, she said, on what's happening with our children emotionally. There are lots of environmental factors in homes, in the community, which begin in utero uh, as they're developing in their mother's uh, stomachs. Um, and for example, what's being put into the body when mothers are carrying children, an increase in uh, crack babies, fatal alcohol syndrome, even before they get to the classroom, often because children don't have physical disabilities, she said, it's easy to overlook emotional and psychological issues. Um, so when children get into higher grades, they have problems and issues that obstruct and or prevent learning. New York State has a mandate for pro-social emotional development, which is supposed to be a focus throughout New York, but there's no money to back the mandate. She said that she has only been in Rochester for a year and a half to two years, and that it is clear to her that a large numbers of children are being misdiagnosed, which is contributing to them uh, falling further and further behind. And she related, she told us about a situation where she went with a parent to a, a committee. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to okay, ask you to wrap that up. Let, let me just make this last point. This, because, again, Dr. Keller, and, and I'm not a gentleman. I don't think I'm just mentioning Dr. Keller because he's sitting here. Dr. Keller really is a gem and a treasure in this community. His research is unquestionable. He's an avid researcher. And it blows my mind how we go all over the world looking for people like Dr. Keller. And, we just, and, and Dr. Hirsch is here. And Dr. Ray is here. And there are other, and, and the, the ex-mayor is here who's engaging in some research.
research right now, Bill Johnson. So he, he talks about this, he writes about this, that there's a lot of money being wasted on ineffective programs in education. And we need to redirect some of those resources to deal with these kinds of issues. That's very important. Thank you.